Thank you for that. That's, those are the announcements for today. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this morning. Everything that our eyes have seen thus far, our ears have heard, our hearts are rejoicing over it, Father God. We thank you for this time you've given us now as we break the bread of life. Father God, I just pray you would decrease me. Holy Spirit, stand up in me strong and mighty. For the people need to hear the Spirit of God and not Steve. Bless, Father God, your word today. Bless our pastor and his wife as they're away, Father God. We pray that they are enjoying where they are, that they're getting the rest that they need to get, and that, Father, you'll bring them safely back home. As we go throughout this weekend, Father God, realizing that it's a long weekend, a holiday weekend, keep us safe, Father God. Keep us safe, Father God. Keep us on guard. Let us, Father God, just love our families, love our friends, and just, Father God, enjoy you basking in your goodness. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How y'all feeling this morning? I'm feeling great, man. I don't know about y'all, but I am feeling outstanding. And I feel outstanding because God is good. Oh, he's good. So good. Beloved, over the last four weeks, our Wednesday night Bible study sessions have been centered around Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In week one, we dealt with rejoice because of who you are in Christ. And we, we primarily stayed on verse 1. Somebody said, I didn't know you could, you could teach a Bible study that long on one verse. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you can if you know what you're doing. Yes, you can. And, but we did introduce verse 2 because in week 2, we dealt with this. Beware. No momentum killers allow. And that came from uh, verses 2 and uh, 3. And then we went into week 3 where we dealt with that I may win Christ. That I may win Christ. And that was from verses 7 through 9. This past Wednesday, we dealt with, do you really want to know Jesus Christ? Do you really want to know him? And see, there's a difference between knowing about him and truly knowing him. And we dealt with that uh, on this past Wednesday. Today brings us to our monthly initiative. And we're going to be looking here. We're going to be going to Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. And you can get there in your Bibles. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, as we continue looking at what Paul is telling this church at Philippi in this third chapter. Amen? Are we there? Amen. It says, brethren, I count not myself... I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press, I press, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. For just a little while, I want to... Uh, Bring your attention to the theme, reach forth and press toward. Reach forth and press toward. The Apostle Paul, my brothers and sisters, wrote to the early church at Philippi to encourage them to abound in Jesus' love, to adopt the mind of Christ, and to follow in Jesus' footsteps. And he let them know that in order to accomplish these things, they would have to enter into Jesus' suffering his death, and his resurrection. Did y'all understand that? Did y'all get that? They would have to enter into his suffering, his death, his resurrection. My brothers and sisters, that is true for us today. That is just as true for us today as it was for them. We have to enter into Jesus' death, his suffering, and his resurrection. This past Wednesday, we dealt extensively with verse 10, where Paul talked about the power of, of Jesus' resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being made conformable unto his death. And he did all of this, all that he might know Christ. 
that he might know Christ. Paul starts out, if we look at it in verse 13, let's look at this for a minute. He says, brethren, I count myself, I count not myself to have apprehended. He starts this out with, with a bit of transparency and humility by saying that he hadn't yet arrived. He, 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 he hadn't yet to London made it. He ain't made it yet. And he wasn't all that in a bag of chips. Y'all know people like that. Think they, they stuff don't stink. You know? They all that. You know? No, no, you, 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 you beneath me. You under me. You know, they, they, they have this air of arrogancy about them. Paul says, no, no, no. I'm not that. I'm not that. He says, for everything... That he talked about in verses 5 and 6. And you got to go back and read this because he talks about this. Uh, in 5 and 6, it was concerning his pedigree, his social status, his who's who in Jewish society. Paul realized that nothing compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have this thing now, uh, genealogy, where you can trace, you know, your, your genealogy. And, Ooh, I come from African kings and queens. That's nice. <laughs> I mean, that's, not, that, that's nice. I'm from royalty. I'm from this. My great, 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 great granddaddy was a billionaire. That's nice. But you can't rub two pennies together. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, see, all of that really don't matter. What you should be seeking after is what Paul was seeking after, the excellency. He said the excellency of knowing Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Paul yearned to know the power of Jesus' resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. To this end, he had not yet, he said, I've not yet apprehended this thing. I've not yet seized it. I've not yet grasped. I got a few questions I would just want to ask y'all. Can I ask y'all some questions? All right. How important is knowing Jesus Christ to you? Oh, y'all want to talk back. I like that. Here's another one. Is your knowledge of Jesus simply head knowledge or is it heart knowledge? We dealt with this. Sarah, we dealt with this Wednesday night. Is it head knowledge? You just know about him. Well, mama told me he's a way out of no way. Or is it heart knowledge? I've gone through some things, and I know for myself he is a way out of no way. See, there's a difference there. So is your knowledge of Jesus simply head knowledge, or is it heart knowledge? Amen? And then, if a sinner, hear me now, if a sinner ask you to tell them about Jesus, how would you articulate Christ to them? Now, I know Phil and Sherry, they ain't, they ain't got no problem with that. They better not. They teach evangelism. <laughs> but how would you, my brothers and sisters, if, if you met a sinner on the street and they said, tell me something about Christ, could you articulate, Tanya? I know you could. If you couldn't, you, t- you turned in your sistership with me. <laughs> but, but how would you articulate that? Or c- could you be able to? Maybe that's a better question. Could you be able to tell somebody about Christ? Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, as the Holy Spirit was giving me these questions, uh, it reminded me of this story that I, that I heard some years ago. The story's about a little girl who left church one Sunday afternoon with her family. The family went home, and the little girl started running throughout the house, singing and humming. She went into her big brother's room, and she asked, Big bro, do you know Andy? Brother looked at her and he told her that he didn't know nobody named Andy. What are you talking about, girl? 
the little girl ran into her parents' bedroom. She asked her mama, Mama, do you know Andy? The mother replied that she didn't know anybody named Andy, and she needed a little girl to help her to set the dinner table. The little girl ran downstairs to her father's office. She said, Daddy, do you know Andy? Perplexed and bewildered, the father asked, Who in the world is Andy? And then he replied, Andy, better not be in my house. <laughs> the little girl began opening every closet door, started pulling things out of the closets, all the while hollering, Andy, are you in here? The brother ran out of his room, the mother ran out of her bedroom, and the father ran out of his office. They came to where the little girl was sitting in the middle of the living room floor, asked her, What's going on? What's wrong with you? Why are you asking about Andy? The little girl looked up at them, tears streaming down her face. She stopped long enough to ask, didn't y'all hear the pastor this morning? She replied in his sermon, he kept talking about Andy. Don't y'all remember or am I the only one who heard him? The brother, the mother, and the father looked at each other. Gus, total confusion in their faces. The little girl got up. She grabbed her hairbrush, and she started to imitate the pastor by saying, Andy walks with me. Andy talks with me. Andy tells me I am his own. The father reached down, he picks the little girl up into his arms, and he replies, baby, pastor wasn't talking about Andy. He was talking about the Lord. And he, not Andy. So you see, baby, and he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. Do you mind, can I go just a little bit further with this? <laughs> Since I do know the Lord. Since I got heart knowledge on top of head knowledge. I just want to tell you, and he is a way out of no way. And he is a bridge over troubled water. And he is a burden bearer. And he is a heavy load sharer. And he is water when I'm thirsty. And he is the bread of life. Ah, uh, uh, let me stop right there. Ah, uh, because I can't keep you here too long. I know y'all got Costco's chicken on your mind. <laughs> Paul, 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 Paul said, Paul said, I don't count myself to know it all for you. I don't count myself to have it all. And I don't count myself to be, all, be it all. I've made some mistakes in life. See, a lot, a lot of us would be better off if we just own up to the mess and the crap we used to do. You want to walk in here with your super, super Christian cape on. And when a young person messes up, you want to just go all upside their head. Forgetting about 30, 40 years ago, you did the same thing. I made, y'all don't like me, that's okay, some mistakes in life, John. I've, I've done some wrong things in my life. I've said some hurtful things, guess what, that I can't take back. You got to understand, whatever comes out of your mouth, there is no way you can reel that thing back in. No way. And all of the I'm sorry's. All of the, I didn't mean it like that. No, 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 baby. No, 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 no. You said it. You said it. And it had to have been on your heart for you to say it. Amen? I, 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 I've not always been loving. I've not always been patient. I've not always been kind. 
But here's the part I like. What Paul said next. He said, but this one thing I do. I love the Bible. I love the Bible, Clarence, when something is said, and then you get that but in there. Because after the but, it seems like it's always better. Whatever's coming, amen? He said, but this one thing I do. Brothers and sisters, if you don't do anything else, please do this one thing. Paul said, I'm forgetting those things which are behind me. Beloved, listen to this. You cannot move forward if you're always looking backward. How are you going to go forward when you're doing this? That's why your rearview mirror is so small, but your windshield is so big. You glance in your rearview mirror. But you look out your front windshield. Amen? Paul realized that his pedigree car, uh, that that was a part of those things, was garbage. Rubbish. King James Version even called it dung. Is who you are and what you used to do trash? Is it garbage? Is it dumb? It should be. Hold on, preacher. Do you know I got, I got eight degrees? Okay. Okay. That's nice. So what? And I ain't down in education. Don't nobody walk out of here. Oh, he don't like education. No, I ain't saying that. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if Christ ain't in your life, if Christ ain't in your life, see, there's a difference when Christ is in your life versus if he's not. Paul said, all that I used to do, all that who I used to be, because y'all got to remember, y'all got to remember that Damascus Road experience changed Saul to Paul. And so when, when Paul goes in to start preaching, The people had a problem because they saw Saul. Who do people see when they see you? Do they always want to bring up who you used to be? Or do you correct them? No, 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 babe. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on, wait a minute, let me tell you about, listen. (laughs) The song says, things that I used to do, I don't do them no more. Since Jesus came in to my heart. Amen? Amen? So, So here it is, here it is. Here it is. Many times, many times, we allow things to happen. But Paul says, this stuff, this stuff, they want to they wanna trap you in, keep you behind. He said, uh, no, that's garbage. That's junk. That's dumb. That's rubbish. Paul said his pedigree wasn't going to save him. He knew that. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can save. Many times, my brothers and sisters, in this life, We let our past define our future. Some of us can't get unstuck from our past. We don't know how to do it. We allow people to speak negative words into our lives. Many of us have been told we'll never be nothing. I know it's a double negative there. So I'll say anything. We'll never be anything. We'll never have anything. We'll never amount to anything. Who remembers this scene? (laughs) 
Now, yeah, I talked to them before this. Some glad morning, when they get it together, we'll sit on the screen. All right. You gonna let this little nappy head gal sit here and cuss you out like that? You sitting at the head of your own dinner table and you acting like a waiter. She'll be back. She'll got talent. She can sing. She got spunk. She can talk to anybody. She can stand up and be noticed. But what you got? You're ugly, you're skinny, you're shaped funny, and you're too scared to open your mouth to people. All you fit to do is be Shug's maid. Oh, no. Take out a slop jar and maybe cook her food. And you ain't even that good of a cook anyway. <laughs> well, she's a lot better than that first wife you married. And this house ain't been clean good since my first wife died. And nobody crazy enough to marry you. So what you gonna do? Hire yourself to fall? <laughs> or maybe somebody let you work on that railroad. <laughs> make, make, make me sweep out the caboose. <laughs> Any more letters come? Could be. Could be none. Who's to say? Say they go. Until you do right by me, everything you think about is gonna crumble. You can't cuss nobody. Look at you. You're black, you're poor, you're ugly, you're a woman, you're nothing at all. Do you do right by me? Everything you even think about gonna fail. I should have locked you up and she just let you out to work. The jail you plan for me is the one you're gonna rot in. See, they get in the car, get in the car. Knocked you up Everything you've done to me, already done to you. Amen. I love that scene. I love that scene. And you know, the, the, the ironic thing about that, some of y'all too young to even remember what, that movie. For those of y'all, y'all know it? Okay, Color Purple. Color Purple. Take about three and a half hours out of your life and, and look at that movie. Amen. But the ironic thing about that movie is, Mr or Albert, as she found out his name was, spent the rest of that movie trying to make amends to her for all the wrong he had done to her. And so, my brothers, I showed that because I, I want you to understand what people say about you. What people think about you. You know, the only person, I love my wife, but the only person that I care about knowing who I truly am, yeah. Yeah. my Heavenly Father. My Heavenly Father. Because here's the thing. I love Tracy. Tracy loves me. But there's some things Tracy can't do for me and I can't do for her. Yeah. Only God can do that. Yeah. Only God can do that. Amen? So don't let, don't let people... Talk about your advice. You saw what she did. Just do that. 
Next time they start. <laughs> just do that. You ain't got to say nothing. Just do that. It's going to stop. This. You saw it stopped him in his tracks, didn't you? Just do that. All you got to do. <laughs> and if, if you got, look, now I ain't making fun of nobody, no. But if you got one of them arthritic fingers, it really works, boy. <laughs> It'll really work for you. Paul. <laughs> I'm sorry. Paul said, Paul said that he was not going to stay stuck in his past. He was not going to allow the good things to sway him nor the bad things to deter him from what lay ahead for him. Did you get that? His next declaration, as we look at this, he said to reach forth. Amen? To reach forth. We go back. Here we go. Reaching forth. Right? Reaching forth. To those things that were before him. This term, reaching forth, is a Greek, original Greek, uh, notes. Uh, you making fun of me? The definition, I ain't trying it again because of you. The definition is to stretch oneself forward upon something. Amen? It's just not, no, I, I didn't take, I, I'm not Greek, so I really don't know. I'm just trying to phonic, phonically. Y'all graduates, help me out. Y'all just sitting up there with your caps and gowns on, letting me stumble all over this. Help a brother out. But it is to stretch oneself forward upon. Amen. And, and, and to reach forth is a progressive action. One which continues even as we gain rewards because the ultimate goal is not yet within our reach. This kind of reaching keeps us going even when we stumble, slip, or fall. Paul, if you, if you, if you study this, he's using this analogy. In this, of an athlete running a race. The athlete reaches forth. He or she extends themselves at the end of the race to cross the finish line ahead of the competition. Now, have you ever watched a really close race, like the 100 meter dash? And as the competitors come in, I ain't gonna run, but as they come in <laughs> neck and neck toward the finish line, they extend themselves, right? trying to be the de declared the winner of the race. And this is the analogy that Paul is giving us. Paul says this is a type of a a effort we need to have as we reach forth to those things that are before us. As stated earlier, for Paul, those things were the power of Jesus' resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being made conformable to his death, Jesus' death. Now, these are the exact same things we as Christians should be reaching forth as well. In verse 14, Paul says, let me go back here. I press toward the mark. This press means to pursue in such a manner of hesitancy. He says, or to follow after. Please understand that, that this Activity of following Jesus Christ. What we do when we say we are followers of Jesus Christ, we are disciples of Jesus Christ, it it's going to require some exertion on your part. It's something that you must do. You will expend some energy in following Jesus Christ. It will require of your time and of your personal effort. Anyone who thinks that a Christian can live a life of purpose for Jesus Christ without any effort whatsoever has truly never tried to live for Jesus Christ. Y'all know we busy down here. We are busy. Y'all see, I'm up here sweating. Because it requires some effort. Annette was up here directing the young people. 
It requires, and that just couldn't stand there. These kids will look like her like she's crazy. What's she doing? It required effort on her part. And serving Jesus is going to require effort on all of our parts. Y'all remember, what, about a year or so ago, pastor preached that, that sermon, Stuffed Animals? See, we don't, we don't want no stuffed animals in new creation. But we want everybody to be actively involved. What are you doing for the Lord? That's the question you need to ask yourself. What am I, am I, am I, am I exerting myself? Or I'm just calm, cool, and collected. Y'all do the work. I'll come in at the end. Now, we got some folk like that now. We got folk in the church like that. You do all the work, and they come in at the end. And they want all the credit. But see, well, here's the thing about it. Where you may be able to fool me, you cannot ever fool God. God knows your heart. God knows if you're really going to do a thing or not. He knows. He knows how, he even knows, here's the thing, he even knows how much effort you're going to put toward it. Because see, some of us will come, out, come down here and we'll just half-heartedly do it. Because we're checking boxes. I want y'all to know I was here. I was here. And then you go. But see, you can't ever fool God. Amen? Amen. Pressing toward the mark is going to take something out of you. It will require something from you. Now, now what is this mark? What's this mark that Paul alludes to? He said, I press toward the mark. What is this mark? The mark means the object set up at a distance to which one looks to or aims for. And hence, the goal. Remember, Paul's talking about racing, right? Running. The goal or the post which was set up at the end of the race course. And which was to be reached in order that the prize might be won. The mark is the goal at the end. That's the mark. The mark for us, my brothers and sisters, is heaven. Are you pressing toward the mark? Anybody want to go to heaven? Mm. The mark is heaven. Paul let Timothy know about the prize of the high calling. Excuse me, let me go back. If, if we're going to complete our lives to God's glory, we must make heaven our goal. And we must not stop until we get there. If we stop short before we reach heaven, we, can, we will certainly stop short of God's purpose in our lives. So, my brothers and sisters, another question. How is your aim? How is your aim? Are you hitting the mark? Do, do, can you see this? How many arrows hit that target? Not a single one. About 20 or so of them up there, right? Not a single one. Even hit the outside edge. Okay, maybe you can't hit the middle. I get that, Larry. But my goodness, you, you couldn't get right here? You couldn't get right there? I think closest one may be over here. But we have to, every day, strive to hit the mark. I love, I love, I love watching the Olympics. And for some reason, the last time it was around, I found myself watching the uh, archery competition, you know, and I can't shoot an arrow worth nothing, but I just love to watch them as they would draw back and they hold it about right here and they line up and they just, and it 
to go. One guy hit, I don't know, 10, 10 bullseyes in a row. Dude was on fire. He was on fire. But he was hitting the mark. Brothers and sisters, we cannot miss the mark. Beloved, while the mark is heaven, Paul, Paul let Timothy know about the prize for the high calling in Christ Jesus here in 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 through 8. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to, unto who? All of them also that do what? Love his appearing. To all who love his appearing. Yeah, brothers and sisters, I'm going to wear a crown. One of these days, I shall wear a crown. When it's all over down here, I shall wear a crown. I'm going where the wicked shall cease from troubling and the weary shall be at rest. The prize, the prize, he says, press toward, right? The prize. Is the incorruptible and immortal life that Paul described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Go read about it in verses 51 through 57. That's what the prize is. The prize, not a trophy. See, see, a lot of us got a lot of trophies in our houses, don't we? We got ribbons, we got medals, we got accommodations got a lot of things in our homes that speak to who we are, right? But Paul says, that garbage, garbage, garbage. Because if I don't have Christ Jesus, what does it matter about those things? Because here's the thing about it. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> I'm going to share this. I called my brother Marvin yesterday. First I called Anthony, and I was just surprised. Anthony said he didn't have a trophy in the house. I was shocked. Phil, Anthony didn't have a trophy in the house. I couldn't believe it. So then I called Marvin. Marvin said, I'm going to have to go out in the garage. <laughs> Because here's what happens, and I love that, is that we, 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 we display these things for a while, don't we? But these, 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 are, these are the things we're proud of, the accomplishments and the achievements we've made, right, in life. And about, hmm, I'll give you six months. You can't even remember where they are. Marvin said, <laughs> I'm going to have to go out in the garage and look for him. He said, text me later, bro, <laughs> to remind me <laughs> to go look for him. Because for Marvin, while he was proud of these at a certain time in his life, and he displayed them, and there's nothing wrong with that. But now, in Christ Jesus, I can lay these trophies down because I have a greater prize that's waiting for me up in glory. Uh-huh. I got a, some say, I got a new name over in glory. And it's mine, mine, Mine. And so, brothers and sisters, don't get so wrapped up in your, in your trophies and your, your accommodation. It's nice. You guys, it's beautiful. You're wearing your robe. You got your, your, your uh, ropes, your stoles. Maddie got a stole on here. They got the words all up, and up, up, up one side, down the other. That's a beautiful thing because it means you just didn't go to school 
to be nothing and nobody. It displays the work you did at Grambling State. And you should be proud of that. You know what I'm saying? You should not be. But there comes a time in our lives when we've got to lay down that kind of stuff. Put on the whole armor of God. That's what we've got to do, amen? Amen. I'm closing. I'm coming to my close. Mama Kelly, I'm closing. Coming to my close, dear. Let me ask this. Let me try to apply it to us now. What? 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 What are, as Paul talked about, those things that are before us here at New Creation? As we as we continue to live out this year's theme, Our Hands Unstoppable Momentum, we see the ball. I had them bring this up front. I'd been having it in Bible study up front. It's been sitting back here. But it's always been my experience that if we don't keep things in the full front, we quickly forget about them. So I had them bring this up because the ball, what's on the ball? Who can, Josh, read that for me. What's that say? The mission, the members, and the ministry. That's what the ball, and remember, this is just a representation, okay, of our theme this year. But it represents the mission. It represents the members. That's y'all. And it represents the ministry, what we do here. Amen? We can do none of these if we first don't reach for them. Remember Paul said, I'm reaching forth. So we first must reach. Amen? Then he says, I'm pressing toward. I'm pressing toward the mark. What's the mark? The mission, the members, and the ministry. And I'm not just, I know we said our hands on the ball, but I'm not just gonna place my hands on the ball. Understand? Eric, because just placing my hands on doesn't do anything. What I have to do, I have to press into. You have to press into. The ball. We all have to press into the ball. Because what happens is when we press into the ball, don't y'all ooh and all, it comes off and it go back on. <laughs> when we press into the ball, we start to move the ball. My hands on it, but are your hands on it too? Because it's gonna take all of our hands to be on this ball. Because as you see, the incline, the momentum incline, it's an incline, not a decline. We're going up, y'all. Higher and higher. Higher and higher. Lord, what is it that you would have us to do? Yes, Lord, we shall do that. Yes, Lord, we can do that. We keep our hands on the ball. What we're trying to do, though, is to eliminate the momentum killers. Those who would kill the momentum. Amen, come here, Marvin. Those who would kill the momentum. We, we, we got to get rid of the momentum killers. Notice now, as it sat there, now I've taken it off. Where are my hands? My hands in front of the ball, right? Marvin represents the momentum killers. Push, brother. I'm trying to get the ball. I'm trying to get it. But, but your nasty negative attitude, you don't want to do nothing. You don't want... Oh, brother. He down here turning red. Let me stop. Thank you, thank you, brother.
because you don't want to do it. Because you don't see no need for it. Because you just think it's a waste of time. Why y'all always down there? Every time you look up, y'all down there. Don't be a momentum killer. Don't be on the wrong side of the ball. Because we are trying to have that inertia to push the ball. I don't need you pushing against me. I need you to help me. And is anybody going to help push the ball? Anybody? Collectively, as we start to press in, applying gentle, even pressure, we move the ball up the incline. And here's the thing. This incline represents the challenges that we're going to face this year. See, it would be easy to be here and just roll the ball down. It don't take much effort to do that, right? No. God has so designed it that we must start at the lowest point and work our way up the incline. Because, see, that's where the work comes in. That's where you're going to have to exert yourself. You may even have to get a little sweaty. That's why they make soap and water. Go home, take a shower. You'll be all right. But we're moving. We're moving. We're moving it. We're moving it. We're not going to stay stagnant. We're not going to stay stagnant. We're going to keep pushing it up. Because God has great things for us to do on earth. On earth. It's not just waiting till heaven. What are you doing now? What are you doing here? What are you doing to advance his kingdom? Amen? The last thing I want to say, the last question I want to pose to you. Are you going to reach forth and press toward? Are you going to do that? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Am I all in? Am I truly buying into what the theme is for this year? Will I reach forth? Because it takes effort. Will I press in? Because that's going to take some effort too. The ball, this is, this is not a real heavy ball. But that's my brother when he was trying to push back. Was I not pushing? Because it's not going to be easy. I don't know if you saw him. He got a little low on me there for a minute. <laughs> some of, sometimes you're going to have to get low. Sometimes you can't, you can't stay up here. Sometimes you're going to have to get low. But that's okay. That's okay. The thing is, reach for and press toward. Amen? Amen. God bless. Somebody may be here today. You need God to do something for you. You've heard the word of God. Maybe you came in here and you didn't know who Jesus Christ was. But after hearing the word of God, the Holy Spirit has pricked your heart. And now you say, I want to know more about Jesus. I want to know more about the Savior. Anybody, does that, does that speak to anybody? If so, just raise your hand. You need a personal relationship with the Lord. You need a personal relationship. Secondly, maybe you're in a church right now. Maybe it's not in common. It's somewhere else. But where you are, you're not growing. You're just there. You're a stuffed animal sitting in the seat there. But because you came here today, God says there's work for you to do over here, my child. Come on, join this fellowship. 
If that speaks to anybody, raise your hand. Amen. The third call. You're in church. But you've backslidden. You've gotten away from God. And God has been tugging at you, telling you, get yourself back in. Get back in church. Get active. Do. Be a doer of my word, not just a hearer only. If that, if that talks to anybody, speaks to anybody, wave your hand. Amen. We're going to listen to this song. Because I don't know about y'all, but I need God to do something for me. Do you know God can do it? Turn it up. The altar is open if you need to come to the altar. Only he can solve it. Do it for me. Yes, yes. If God don't do it, then it can't be done. Somebody said, oh, How do I know that? Because mama couldn't do it. Daddy couldn't do it. My brother, my sister couldn't do it. My family couldn't do it. My friends couldn't do it. God do it. I got a problem, y'all. <laughs> yeah. Can't be done. Yeah, Lord. Yeah, Lord. Do it right now, Lord. Those who are here on this altar, whatever it is, Lord, do it right now for them. Yeah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yellow, yellow. I can kill everybody else. Ah. I need you to do it. Yeah, Lord. I try <laughs> everybody else. Lord, do it for me. I try everybody else. Do it for me. Do it for Make that thing personal. Do it for me. Can't nobody, can't nobody do it. Do it like this. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't do it, Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Lord. Yeah, Lord. Yes. Yes. Lord, if you don't do it, if you don't do it, come on, clap your hands if you need God to do something right now. Come on, say, God, I need you to do it right now. Do it right now, Lord. I need you to do it right now. Do it right now, Lord. Lord do it right now. Lord. Do it right now. Do it for me. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, Lord. Yes, yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Lord, if you don't do it. Yeah. Who gonna do it? It just won't be done. It won't be done. So, Lord. So, Lord. Do it 
for me. Do it for me. Phil, I love you, but you can't do it for me. Sister Edith, I love you, but you can't do it for me. Only God can do it. Anybody know that only God can do it? Only God. Yes. Fix it for me. Fix it. Fix it. Fix it. Come, Lord, I have a problem. I got a problem. I got a circumstance. I got a situation. That only you can solve, Lord. So, Lord. So, Lord, what I need you to do. Do it for me. Is just do it for me. Can y'all play that for me? Yeah, Lord. Lord, do it for me. Some of you been holding on to things for too long. You thought you could fix it. I need you to do it right now. But God says no. Give that thing to me. me. Let me do it. Uh, Lord, if you don't do it, it just can't be done. It just won't be done. Lord. So Lord, do it for me. Some of you right now in a situation, you trying to figure out how to work it out. Lord, You're going to go home today still trying to figure out how to work it out. God says, give it to me. Anybody know God can do it? Do you know he can do it? Do you know he can do it? Fix it, for me. Fix it Lord. Oh, Lord, I have a problem. Yeah, only you. That only you can solve. Lord, do it. Do it. Do it. Lord, do it. You went all to whatever it is you're asking God for. Trust and believe that he will do what he says he's going to do. If God doesn't do it. If God doesn't do it. Somebody said I. Lord, do it. Lord, do it. Online, let the Lord do it. It's too big for you. Give it over to the Lord. Yes. Yes. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. It won't be done. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Anybody need the Lord to do something in your life? If you need God to do something right now, lift your hands. He already knows. Lord, I need you here. Yeah. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. Yeah. If you don't do it, it can't be done. It just won't be done. Ha. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Whatever it is, whatever it is, you need God to do. Trust him. 
He will never let you down. He will never fail you. He will never turn his back on you. What we have to learn to do is wait on God. We dealt with this in married couples ministry Sunday school this morning. Patience. Because we want it when we want it. And most of the times, that's what got us in trouble in the first place. Is that we wanted what we wanted. God does not operate in time. He operates outside of time. So you may have to be like Sarah and wait a while. But guess what? What you was doing was making it worse in the first place. Some of us are in some sticky situations right now. I call them soup sandwich situations. You ever try to make a sandwich with soup? It's just mess. It's just a mess. And some of us are in some very messy situations right now. God says, turn it over to me. Your cry should be what Zacchaeus' cry was. Lord, do it for me. Because Lord, if you don't do it, it just won't get done. Turn it over to the Lord. I guarantee you, he'll work it out. Father, we thank you today. Thank you for your word. Oh, Holy Spirit, I thank you for standing up in me and declaring the word today. I was just a conduit, a vessel that you used. And I just thank you for that. For the opportunity to stand and declare your word. I don't take it lightly. I know your word won't return to your void. I know your word will drop fertile seed and fertile ground. We may not see the results today, but Lord, by and by, over time, that seed that is, has been deposited in the fertile ground will begin to grow because somebody's going to come along after me and water it. And then, Lord, you're going to give the increase. And from that seed, a root will start shooting up through the ground. And that root will start to become a tree, a plant, whatever you would have it to be. So we thank you today. Thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for those who are online and listening to us. I thank you for those who are in the sanctuary. As we prepare to go from this house, but never from your presence, be with us throughout this day, Lord. Let us just, just reflect back on your word, reaching forth, pressing toward. There's a goal in mind. There's a prize that we shall have at the end. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. Hallelujah. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Bless our pastor and his wife, Sharon. Bring them home safely to us, Father God, as we give you all praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Who taught the sun where to stand in the morning? And who told the ocean you can only come this far?